Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to a webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. This is Amy Robertson. I'm the science coordinator for the partnership. And today we are very pleased to have Heather Bateman with us. Dr. Bateman works at Arizona State University in the College of Letters and Sciences in Mesa, Arizona. Her presentation is titled Biocontrol and Restoration, Effects of Salt Cedar Management on Riparian Habitats and Reptiles and Amphibians Along the Virgin River. Our webinar today is being hosted by one of the Desert LCC's critical management question team, team number five which is addressing issues related to management of riparian systems uh, across the desert southwest and northern Mexico. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, especially thank you to Dr. Bateman for sharing this work with us. And now I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Amy. And thanks very much for the invitation to join you via a webinar this morning to talk about our work along the Virgin River. We started this project in 2009 and completed it in 2014. And I would like to acknowledge the Desert and Southern Rockies Landscape Conservation Cooperatives for funding our work along the Virgin River in 2013 and 2014. And my uh, colleagues at Arizona State University and I work in riparian um, or floodplain ecosystems in the Southwest. And we're interested in asking questions about wildlife species habitat relations. And most of our recent work has focused on reptiles and amphibians. So unlike birds, there's relatively few species of reptiles that are considered riparian obligates. However, there are things like freshwater turtles and garter snakes, but we study lizards. And globally, researchers have monitored uh, responses of lizards in order to understand how ecological restoration affects animal populations via changes in vegetation. So lizards and other reptiles uh, respond to structural changes in their habitat, like canopy and woody debris, and also microclimate. About 60% of reptiles and amphibians in the Chihuahuan Great Basin, Mojave, and Sonoran deserts utilize riparian and wetland habitats. And in fact, in the Southwest, reptiles and amphibians are very common species. However, they are seldom included in surveys of riparian ecosystems. So despite their high abundances, there's somewhat limited research on how these taxa um, respond to management um, especially in relation to non-native vegetation. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you today. Um, before I get going, I'd like to um, give acknowledgments to my collaborators. Um, I've, I've had the great pleasure of working with some really fantastic scientists um, that work for agencies and academic institutions. I've worked with colleagues that have expertise in hydrology, plant ecology, remote sensing, ornithology, and um, mathematical modeling. And this work has also um, been important for uh, training the next generation of what I hope to be natural resource managers. We've supported both undergraduate and graduate student research. Um, and several technicians uh, for, with this work over the past six years. So I'd like to begin with a bit of introduction. Uh, if you can see the top of my slides there, it'll give you sort of a framework of where we're going today. Um, and I'll just start with a bit of an introduction um, before we get into our results. And I'm sure many of our listeners are um, quite familiar with salt cedar. Um, it's a non-native, uh, invasive, woody species, comes from Eurasia. It's been in the system for over 100 years. And um, due to changes in stream hydrology and the plant's unique tolerance to drought and saline conditions, salt cedar is very abundant. It's the third most abundant woody plant in riparian areas. It's the second most um, dominant in terms of vegetation cover. And because it's such a common plant, there is a large body of research um, and literature describing the effects of salt cedar on everything from flow regimes and soil to native plants and wildlife. 
And so if our listeners aren't familiar with the relatively recent book by Anna Sharon and Martin Quigley um, titled Tamarisk, um, it's a great resource. And um, looking at, at some of what we do know, um, salt cedar has the um, chance of, of forming these large, dense monocultures. And some of the trends that we see is that these dense monocultures have been linked to declines in diversity of native plants and, and wildlife. And um, a lot of the work on wildlife has focused on uh, bird abundance uh, in riparian areas. And more than 50% of the land birds or terrestrial species, uh, like uh, songbirds, depend on riparian areas at some point in their life cycle. So most of the research on wildlife use and avoidance of salt cedar habitats have focused on birds. And some work by Mark Sogi and colleagues published in 2005 documented about 49 species of birds that, that nest in salt cedar. So it's, a, it's somewhat a tricky issue because not all wildlife may prefer native habitats over salt cedar, but we, we, we tend to see lower abundances of mammals and birds and ground arthropods and even our herp work when we're comparing these large monotypic stands to stands that have a more native uh, riparian tree element. And resource managers um, can utilize a variety of techniques to control salt cedar. Um, everything from chemical herbicide treatment, mechanical physical removal of non-native plants, and then biocontrol. And there, there's not a management, management technique to control salt cedar that probably doesn't have some effect on the ecosystem. And those are the types of questions that, that our group is interested in. So let's talk about biocontrol. So I'm, I'm borrowing um, the title of one of those chapters from the Tamarisk book. Um, and this is a map that is put out every year by the Tamaris Coalition. Um, so I'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with um, these maps. So um, Tamaris Coalition and, and colleagues have, uh, are monitoring the spread of Dirabda species, which is a salt cedar leaf beetle um, that's been introduced as a biocontrol for um, salt cedar. And there's other elements, um, there's other agents of, of biocontrol that we're going to focus on on this today. And I'll just point out that the, the open circles on the map indicate places that have been monitored but where beetles haven't been um, detected yet. And I was just uh, in a meeting last week, and so some researchers from Texas A&M are, are doing some modeling of the beetle dispersal. And it was interesting because we were talking about central Arizona, and so some predictions of when the beetles um, might move into central Arizona via the Gila and into the San Pedro and Salt. Um, some of those projections are around a couple of years from now, so maybe 2017-2018. And um, just a reminder, the definition of biocontrol, um, it's the intentional introduction of a natural enemy to control a pest species. So biocontrol is not about eradication of the pest species, in this case salt cedar, but it's um, about control measures. These are looking at some photographs that were taken from the Virgin River. And what we can see here, we're looking upstream. This is in Arizona. Uh, we're at the base, sort of the foothill area, what you see in the background of the Virgin Peak. Um, and this photograph, taken 20 days apart, shows defoliation of salt cedar. Um, so you see the green and then sort of the brown um, defoliated stands um, after the beetles have, have moved in. And sort of the mechanism here is that the, the beetles are a small chrysomelid beetle, and they mate and lay eggs on salt cedar stems. And then the eggs hatch into larvae, and so the image, the picture that you see on the left are um, uh, various instars or, or life cycles of the beetle larva, and then they drop to the leaf litter and metamorphose into adult beetles. So the larvae tend to do the bulk of the damage of the salt seizure. They forage along the stems of the plant. Um, they, they rupture the cuticle of the plant. They cause it to lose water through transpiration. So this defoliation is um, in response to herbivory, and the plant will tend to drop its green biomass in order to save its reserves and reduce the amount of water that's lost. And um, there's a, a paper that some colleagues and I put out, so I just want to recognize 
um, Tom Dudley and Dan Bean, Steve Ostoyo, Kevin Holtine, and Mike Keen um, with this work. Um, in 2009, we set up several sites along the Virgin River because we knew that the beetle um, wasn't yet present in the system, but in a few years, it would be present. And so this gave us the opportunity to um, be able to ask questions about the effects of biocontrol on the Virgin River ecosystem. Um, and that was important for us to get in there in 2009 during pre-beetle conditions. And, and in this work, in this paper, um, we made some hypotheses. We, we gave some background information about the beetle and biocontrol. Um, and we gave some predictions about what we thought we would see um, in terms of biocontrol effects on wildlife. So I'm just going to use that to sort of gauge where we're going this morning. So we made some ideas that, well, the biocontrol could, could make some changes to the thermal environment through these defoliation events. And wildlife, um, like ectotherms, perhaps, um, might respond positively to an increase in temperature. And um, a lot of our lizards, all of our lizards, in fact, are insect eaters. And so perhaps there would be a response to an additional food resource um, as the biocontrol moves in, that lizards would, in fact, eat the beetle. And um, then we thought, well, we might see some negative responses due to structural changes in the habitat. So um, here we were giving some ideas. We could see changes due to the thermal environment, structural changes, and the addition of a food source, and wildlife might respond to that. This is just orienting um, everybody to the Virgin River in the Southwest. And our study occurred um, across Utah, Arizona, and Nevada. But just in terms of a timeline, um, when we very first started the project in 2009 and 2010, we established sites in the lower Virgin. And so that's those um, triangles that you see in Arizona and Nevada. These represent pre-biocontrol conditions. The beetle came into the system during 2010, but was not extensive, didn't defoliate all of the sites. Now in 2011, that's where we see all of the sites have beetles present, and all of the sites experience defoliation. And so our post-biocontrol conditions then would be 2011 through 2014. Now with the additional funding from the LCCs, we were able to expand our project into Utah. So you see those triangles around St. George. And we were able to um, go into sites that had been restored by the Utah Division of Wildlife. And some of those treatments involved, as, you, as the image shows on the left, some mechanical removal of salt cedar and other non-native woodies, but not all of it. So about 50% of the salt cedar cover was removed leaving other salt cedar intact for habitat, um, planting native vegetation, native, native woodies in the understory, and also diverting water, um, so increasing the hydrologic, hydrologic flows through the system. Um, and so at the end of the talk today, I'll be talking about the results of, of those restored sites, sites. So in terms of some of our field methods, how we monitor wildlife and habitat, um, we conduct mark recapture uh, research on reptiles and amphibians. We also quantify ground arthropods and the beetle in our pitfall traps. In terms of quantifying habitat, that involves measuring um, vegetation structure through transects and plots. And we would quantify things like cover, um, stem counts of, of woody species, um, litter depth, woody debris. We also um, established um, hobo loggers or um, data loggers that help us to, to quantify temperature and humidity. And we also used um, some remote sensing techniques to um, quantify things like NDVI. And, and that's a vegetation index that quantifies green biomass. And um, I'll, I'll just say the importance of, of being in this system prior to biocontrol allowed us to compare sort of what is the condition of the Virgin River prior to any biocontrol so that we can com we have a before and after comparison. And we looked at our sites, we stratified them across different vegetation types. So we made sure that we had sites that were established in these monotypic stands of salt cedar, 
as well as places um, where salt cedar um, occurred and also had some element of native trees. And I'll just say that it's important to recognize that the Virgin River system um, does not have stands that are 100% native. That just doesn't occur on the Virgin um, in the system where we're working. And so salt cedar is still very common and in fact accounts for 60 to 65% of the vegetation cover, even in our mixed stands. Um, some of the natives that are important here are um, cottonwoods, willows, and mesquite. Okay, so a little bit of results. Um, first, I want to get into um, that early work where we're showing, um, just documenting the habitat and the wildlife um, prior to any um, beetle moving in. And um, this is looking at how those two stand types differ in, in terms of the monotypic stands and these mixed stands. And so the, the image or the, the graph that I'm showing here is a principal components analysis. And this is an ordination technique. And so all of those dots that you see are individual sites where we're monitoring. And um, the PCA is an ordination technique. And this arranges or orders our sampling units along environmental gradients. And so on the x-axis, the environmental gradient we're looking at is um, amounts of overstory. And I'll use my pointer here and indicate that um, uh, values that are on the, the high values on the x-axis would indicate these are all sites that have high amounts of canopy cover and these are more open. And the dark circles represent the mixed habitats and the open circles are those monotypic um, stands of tamarisk. And what you can see sort of just by the scatter of the points is that the mixed stands have much greater variation, and the monotypic stands tend to be more similar to each other. The monotypic stands have greater amounts of overstory. Those open um, sites would be in the mixed sites. So on the y-axis, the other environmental gradient that we're looking at is degree of native species and woody debris. And you can see that the high um, values here pretty much um, only occur in the mixed stands, and this makes sense. There's greater plant diversity. Um, and more elements of that woody debris. So that sort of describes the habitat prior to biocontrol. Now when we look at um, sort of the responses of wildlife, this is looking at the lizard community. And what we see is that abundance tends to be greater in the mixed stands um, where there's lower densities of salt cedar. And this rank abundance curve is plotting the black line would indicate those stands that have salt cedar and native trees, and the red would be those monotypic stands of salt cedar. And so um, we have some species like tiger whiptails that are very ubiquitous and common in both stand types. But what we see in the salt cedar stands, there's fewer of those rare species. They tend to drop out sooner, um, and uh, they persist in the native stands. So things like the, the lizard that you see here um, on the left, is um, spiny lizards, and they are semi-arboreal, and, and so they're tied to habitat elements of large diameter trees and woody debris. So we found some species, like the spiny lizard you see here, and also side blotch lizards, are tied to elements of the habitat that are associated with um, stands that have native and non-native trees. We didn't find any species that were only associated with habitat found in those monotypic stands of salt cedar. Um, and the species that were most abundant in those monotypic stands were, were generalist species. They could tolerate um, a broad, um, uh, broad conditions of habitat and dietary generalists as well. So before I, I go into the results, showing the effects um, after biocontrol moves into the system. Here I just want to show you um, a, a diagram of beetles as they, as they move through the study site. So I'm going to take it just a little bit of time explaining this figure because I'm going to show you a couple other figures that are going to look like this. And so um, abundance is on the y-axis and then we have time on the x. And um, 2009 and 2010 again are considered pre-biocontrol. We did have um, a few beetles move into the system, but not all of the sites experienced that in 2010. Um, the different color lines that you see um, 
represent the relative abundance of salt cedars. So the red lines, those are stands that have very high, like 100% salt cedar cover. And then we work our way down to the low, medium and low um, stands. So medium and low would have um, a greater proportion of native trees. Okay, so this is just looking at the, the dirapta, the beetles as they move into the system. In 2011, this is the site where, um, this is the time period where beetles um, move in. This is our largest outbreak. All sites were defo defoliated in the study, and the highest density of beetles um, were documented during this year, and the highest densities occurred in salt cedar stands. And how beetles move temporally and spatially through the Virgin River is, is also interesting. And so um, in this next image, I want to show a bit of an animation. And let's see. Okay, so um, down in the bottom left, this is our time scale. And 2009 is pretty boring because beetles aren't moving in. So let me just orient you to the sites. So this is showing the lower virgin. So these are our sites in Arizona and Nevada. And um, so when they're filled in like this, we're now monitoring and counting beetles. All of the sites have these numbers. And what the numbers indicate is the uh, proportion of tamarisk cover. So the really high numbers, like 24 and 23, those have a high amount of tamarisk uh, or salt cedar cover. The low numbers are much more native. And so this gives you a relative abundance. So 2010, beetles are just starting to move into the system. But what you notice is that beetles are coming from St. George area, moving downstream, but it's not that every site um, gets hit in a linear fashion. There's a bit of leapfrogging that happens. Um, it's very patchy. You'll have these outbreaks of beetles and defoliation, and then they move on to maybe skip over a whole other stand and hit another stand. So it's somewhat patchy in nature. Um, so 2011 um, is that biggest outbreak. Um, the numbers of beetles um, in the sites are very high, and they're at their highest in the sites that have the most uh, salt cedar cover. 2012 and 2013, um, uh, not a lot going on um, because the, we have fewer beetles in the system. The beetles come out later in the year. They don't come out until about July. Um, the vegetation has recovered a little bit, but we know that there's much less green biomass for them to uh, forage on. So the beetle numbers are lower during this time. And then as we start getting, so here's 2013, right? Just not a lot of beetle activity in our stands at all. Um, vegetation has some time to recover. And then here's 2014. We have those big numbers again. The vegetation has recovered. Um, and so the outbreak happens a little bit earlier in May. Um, and beetle activity really slows down in July and August. So I'll move on to the next slide here, but that just gives you some of the temporal and spatial movement of the beetle through the stand, which is kind of interesting. Um, so let's look at how the, the biocontrol affects the microclimate. Um, this publication um, focused on that first year uh, when the beetles were most active, so these are data from 2011, and looking at um, the different panels, so A, B, and C. Um, a is, is looking at the relative abundance of the beetles as they move through the site, and so you have the, the peak of beetle activity um, um, coinciding with defoliation here um, at the zero timeline. And the B panel is looking at relative humidity in the sites, and we see the sites are, are pretty humid, about 70-80% relative humidity. After that defoliation, humidity drops to about 40% humidity. The panel C is looking at maximum daily temperature, and we're comparing this to a site from a NOAA weather station in the town of Mesquite, um, hypothetically should be unaffected by biocontrol. And what we see is the maximum daily temperature is around 40, 41 degrees. And then after that defoliation event, we start to see that the, the sites that are the dark, which are our study sites in the Virgin River, um, are much higher than that weather station um, data. And the sites increase about three degrees C um, after defoliation, so that's fairly hot. Um, looking at this grayscale panel over on the right side, um, this is information from remotely sensed data. 
And the satellite images here are showing elements of, of green biomass. And so the white that you see are areas of high green biomass. This is high vegetation cover. And this looks, in, this is in stark comparison to the desert surrounding, which is the gray. Um, our study area is highlighted in red. And you can see before defoliation, lots of green biomass. And then afterwards, um, after defoliation, the grain. And what we've quantified is that the vegetation index decreased by about 70% in these monotypic stands of salt cedar. And interestingly, the green biomass also de decreased to that same extent in our mixed stands. But remember, uh, the Virgin River still has um, high proportions of salt cedar. So that doesn't mean that um, native trees are being defoliated. It just means there's a lot of salt cedar in the system. Okay, so this is looking at um, the relative abundance of our lizards in the sites before and following um, biocontrol. And uh, the dark circles here represent our mixed stands, and the open circles are those monotypic stands of salt cedar. And what we see is a decrease of um, abundance uh, in our traps uh, after biocontrol. And that decrease persists a few years up to four years that we monitored um, after biocontrol. So we were somewhat surprised um, in the extent of the decline. Um, we thought that maybe the mixed habitat sites wouldn't experience as great of a decline because maybe they would be somehow buffered um, by the effects of the biocontrol. But as the previous slide showed, um, there's a lot of tamarisk even in those mixed sites. It's getting defoliated, even those mixed stands have reduced amount of cover, higher solar radiation, um, and the temperature goes up. Um, and in 2014, um, that's when we had the fewest captures of lizards um, during the whole period of the study. And some species that were relatively common, like you see here on the left, um, side blotch lizards, were very common in 2000 and 2009. They were actually rarely captured at the end of the study, so that was a bit of a surprise. This is a diagram that is similar to the one I showed you with the beetle abundance. And again, 2009, 2010 are before biocontrol moves in, and then uh, 11 through 14 is after. This is a somewhat busy graph, but let me take you through a couple of things that I think are interesting. First, if you just look at the overall abundance, um, abundance is higher, lizard abundance, lizard activity in the traps is higher before the stands compared to after. And um, the pattern is somewhat different within years. And so it's, it's interesting to look at 2009 and 2010 and sort of a day in the life when we're out checking traps is at the very beginning when we open traps in May, traps are hopping. Um, activity is very high. We're catching last year's hatchlings and juveniles and adults. And then throughout the summer season, um, the traps become less busy. Activity slows down. Uh, lizard activity slows down throughout the summer. So that's sort of what happens um, in these sites. But what we see after biocontrol is that we're missing that peak abundance in May. Um, and of course, I'd like to drill down into these data a bit more to know is there some difference, um, are adults being affected differently than hatchlings? lizards, for example, um, is there some life cycle that's being influenced more or less by biocontrol. Um, also, the, the red line, those are our monotypic stands. We see that they have the lowest abundance of lizards before biocontrol. And then after, sometimes they're the highest. Um, but, but all the stands kind of coalesce and seem very similar in abundance um, after biocontrol moves through. Um, so we have some questions about food. Um, these are insectivorous lizards. And so we were quantifying their food resources in our pitfall traps. And what we see is that the ground arthropods, so these include things that lizards eat, like crickets, beetles, spiders. And what we see is that their food, um, lizard food abundance, so arthropods, don't seem to mirror what the lizards are doing. So lizards are pro not, probably not responding to food. Um, so this is different from the last diagram that I showed you in that the highest abundance of ground arthropods occurred in that first year of biocontrol defoliation. 
And if you recall what the vegetation was doing, as the beetle moves through and defoliation happens, a lot of that green biomass is going to be um, moved from the canopy down to the ground level as, as that green biomass gets dropped by the tamarisk, um, the salt cedar trees. And a lot of ground arthropods are the tritivores, so things like crickets um, rely on vegetation for their food. And this is a guess, but I think that sort of that flush of leaf litter on the ground is benefiting things like um, ground arthropods. And then after that, levels come down um, to what they look like before biocontrol. Okay, the last couple of slides here are looking at the results from 2013 and 2014, looking at those Utah sites. We've expanded up into Utah. And just a reminder, those restoration sites um, in Utah, we had both um, sites that were restored and not restored so that we could tease apart um, the differences we see is due to restoration and not just because we're um, in Utah as compared to the lower virgin. Um, now, the restoration activities, as a reminder, um, the resource managers removed half of the cover of non-native plants like salt cedar, um, and then they left the other half standing. Um, they maintained uh, large diameter native trees, um, they, so they maintained mature trees. There was some planting and then increasing the hydrologic flows by um, diverting water through the stands. And in terms of the habitat of the restored sites, um, the restored sites looked very similar to the habitat that I described at the beginning of the presentation um, with those mixed stands. Um, so the restored activities um, created a matrix of a suitable habitats for things like reptiles and amphibians because they were able to maintain native trees, have um, some amount of canopy cover, there's some woody debris, um, and there's some hydrologic flows. So the graph that I'm showing here is lizard abundance uh, during the last two years of our study, 2013 and 14. And um, what you're seeing along the x-axis is, is looking at our sites, and we've teased out the vegetation a little bit more. So we've, instead of just classifying the vegetation stands as mixed and monotypic stands, we still have those monotypic stands um, right here, the tan sites, tamarisk. Um, and then we have stands that have salt cedar plus mesquite, that's the prosopis, and then salt cedar plus populus and salix, so that would be cottonwood and willow. And then we have the restored stands, which have um, cottonwood and willow. And what we can see is in the last two years of the study, um, as uh, the, the abundance in those restored sites is much higher um, compared to all other stand types. And the levels of abundances that we saw in 13 and 14 in those restored sites were on par with what we were monitoring in the Virgin River prior to any biocontrol back in 2009 and 2010. Um, if, we, if we look at another um, species, specifically um, an amphibian, amphibians responded um, quite positively um, to the restored sites. And they, they were associated with some structural elements of the habitat, but more than anything, they respond to precipitation events like rain, um, and they also probably respond to those hydrologic flows that are found in the restored sites um, that we don't have in the unrestored sites. Okay, so to um, sort of wrap things up and look at some, some big picture of what we learned, um, from our investigations along the Virgin River is that um, control methods, this is similar to what I said at the beginning of the seminar, is that irrespective of what the method is, whether it's mechanical removal or herbicide or biocontrol, um, it, there's likely no control method that's not without some type of an ecological impact. But it's important to understand what those impacts are and how might um, changes in microclimate and the habitat structure and food resources affect wildlife species that might be interesting from a management perspective. And I guess one of our surprises that we had is that the decrease in, in things like lizard abundance in the sites after biocontrol, um, we think that's due to altered the um, microclimate. Those sites that were hotter, even though these are ectothermic species, 
Um, 44 degrees is really hot um, and is probably near the thermal maxima of a lot of these species. And so things like lizards can't leave the system. They can't fly away from these sites, but they can reduce their activity and their exposure. And so our activity in the traps go way down. What we think is because of a response to um, too much um, solar radiation um, and higher temperatures. So um, generally, um, what we find is that most taxa um, have greater abundances and diversity in, in more structurally complex habitats. That's not a surprise. We know that from other ecological studies. And so the monotypic stands um, having lower diversity of um, wildlife species is not a surprise. Um, but what I, what I hope this is, is that while we do, um, while we have documented negative short-term effects as a consequence of biocontrol, what I hope I've convinced you of is the importance of restoration. And that's because restoration adds that complexity back into the habitat. There's a bit of a void that's left um, from biocontrol. And biocontrol in and of itself isn't going to increase native riparian trees without some type of intervention um, and increase in hydrologic flows. So um, in, in terms of managing this system, um, being able to add that habitat complexity through um, restoration activities is going to be important um, for managing habitats and wildlife. And, and, and several species outside of what we investigated are likely to benefit from the reintroduction of hydrologic flows um, in the system. Um, so the last couple of slides here are, are looking at um, salt cedar mortality and defoliation. And I'm pulling in um, some information from some colleagues that are also in investigating things like salt cedar mortality in these sites. So Kevin Holteen and colleagues have a recent paper that is looking at how much of those salt cedar, what per proportion of those salt cedar trees um, have died from biocontrol. And their research, similar to ours, looking at just green biomass, canopy dieback, or that volume of canopy of tamarisk trees is really reduced from biocontrol, so cut in half um, our vegetation indices showed a decrease of 69%. But what um, Kevin's group saw is that there's about 10% mortality of um, salt cedar trees. And, and this all re results in, in a hotter, drier um, ecosystem or microclimate in those riparian sites. And what's interesting and what needs to be on sort of the, the radar is, is I mentioned this um, this void that's created by defoliation. And so as that canopy is reduced and more solar radiation comes into the site, there's going to be some secondary plants, secondary species, successional species that come in in response to that open canopy. And in our study, we've seen that things like arrowweed and kochia, these are shrubs, they've really increased their cover and their proportion in, in our study sites after defoliation. And so these are just some pictures that I'm showing you from 2013 and 14 um, uh, that show some, some open areas. And then we have, um, in this case, this is kochia, which is a non-native plant coming in. Um, so those plants are responding to increased thermal um, and, and light. And, and from a habitat perspective, things like arrowweed and kochia are not adding that structural complexity to the habitat. So there still needs to be some management with these secondary plants, with these weedy species coming in, because they're not really increasing or benefiting the habitat structure. And also I'll just mention um, so the risk of fire um, is, is going to be in the system from, from biocontrol, so flammability of, of, of standing defoliated vegetation is going to be high, and, and there's well-documented effects on sort of this positive feedback loop of fire, um, re removing native vegetation. Native vegetation is less tolerant of burning, uh, of burning and so you get yet more um, salt cedar coming in. Um, so I just wanted to add that um, to a bit of the conversation here. Um, so just to wrap up, um, I, I covered a lot of 
um, literature in the talk today, and I'll just put this up. You can pause it later. Um, if any of these sources or, or any literature from my colleagues you don't have access to, um, this is posted on my website. If you don't have access to these journals, um, you know, feel free to send me an email. There's my contact. I'm, I'm happy to send any um, bits of information or, or literature um, out to you if you're interested. So um, I will I will finish there and I will look to the audience. Um, thanks for hanging in there for 40 two minutes um, and see if there's any questions I can uh, I can answer. Thanks so much, Dr. Bateman. Um, you've hit on uh, a fairly wide variety of topics that I know are of great interest to the Desert LCC members um, and, and our partners, so really appreciate that. Um, we do have time for questions, so I just want to remind you about how, how to do that logistically. In the WebEx, you'll see a Participants tab. If you click on that, um, if you have a question, find your name and there's a button with a little hand in it that will allow you to virtually raise your hand. It should be to the right of your name. Um, once you've done that, Dr. Bateman can call on you and you'll need to press star six to unmute your telephone line. So let's okay, try, I, let's try I that. I see a question from Jerry. Jerry, if you want to press star six, I can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, this is Jerry Hilliard. Uh, one of the things that um, you didn't mention, you um, have done a lot of um, monitoring of changes in the um, in the um, in one of the, the ground-based um, Animals. One of the things that you didn't mention, and I wondered if you did any monitoring on Southwest Willow Flycatcher. Um, one of the issues that constantly seems to be raised with um, any kind of control measures on um, tamarisk is that um, even though it's an alien species, um, the Willow Flycatcher seems to like it for nesting, and I wondered whether you had any observations or uh, were monitoring that at all. Sure. Um, in, in 2013 and 2014, um, we were funded by the, the LCC project to look at wildlife, and we did include an element of, of riparian bird species. And so my collaborator on that is Matt Johnson, and he took the lead on the, the bird work. So um, those results are still being written up, but what I can tell you, I can give you a little bit of information on that. So um, Southwestern Willow Flycatcher is in the Virgin River. They're not in, in high abundances, and so they used um, yellow warbler as a proxy um, to understand how might defoliation and restoration affect um, uh, breeding birds, riparian birds. And um, there's, there's uh, the restoration sites, I'll just remind you that um, the reason why the, the folks in Utah didn't remove 100% of the salt cedar was though there was still some structural element of the habitat remaining for wildlife like southwestern willow flycatcher and other species to utilize that middle understory of vegetation. And, and that's important. So um, we're, we're used to thinking of, of non-native plant removal means take it all out. Um, but I think those treatments were beneficial by keeping um, some of that salt cedar in place. Um, there's, there's some uh, you know, focus on the timing of when defoliation happens, and there's a worry that the, the flycatchers and various birds will set up house, essentially, in vegetation, and then it gets defoliated, and that's bad for the birds. Um, what the animation, what I was trying to point out there is that the timing of biocontrol was varied. In some years it was early, and in some years it was late. And I will say that when the biocontrol was late, it didn't coincide with when a lot of birds are nesting. It didn't overlap with that period. But we know that the, the vegetation, the green biomass was affected. And what Matt found is that flycatchers may have nested in some areas um, uh, previously, but they no longer went back to those sites, um, probably because uh, the green biomass wasn't 
the right structure for them. It was reduced, and flycatchers didn't set up house there. They they moved, and flycatchers are very good at finding those areas. So um, he did notice that they moved around um, within the patches. And let's see what what else can I say about um, flycatchers? Since that that wasn't my main focus, but um, do look for some work to come out. So Matt Johnson is with NAU, um, and there's um, uh, a master's student working on that, um, writing that work up as well. Okay, so thank you very much. Thanks for the question, Jerry. Um, Mark has his hand up. Hi, Heather. Thank you so much for your very informative presentation. I wanted to ask you a couple quick things. Um, I know you've done a lot of work in the Middle Rio Grande, and you're aware of, of our uh, biocontrol experiment that's ongoing. Would you speculate that we'll see the same sort of relationships over here in the middle Rio Grande? And then uh, secondly, with the arrowweed and kochia pioneering into those openings, uh, do you see those as being just the first stage of succession and then trees and structure coming in uh, in the future? Okay, thanks, Mark, for your question. Let's see, I'll try to address your first part, which was on the Middle Rio Grande. And in, in some of our papers, we, we did try to draw some com comparisons for the Virgin River and the Middle Rio Grande. Those two systems are pretty different. Um, they're different because in New Mexico, that those sites are higher elevation, the temperatures aren't quite as hot, and in the places where we worked, there was the salt cedar extent was lower. And so when we first went into the Virgin River, we had this idea that the mixed stands might buffer the effects of biocontrol because of the presence of the native species that weren't being affected. Um, and we didn't see that on the Virgin. But maybe, maybe those buffering effects might be seen more on systems like the Middle Rio Grande. And I say that only because of the climate is different um, and the extent of the native vegetation is greater. So um, I, I guess I would speculate and say maybe these short-term effects to, of biocontrol won't be as great on the Virgin, uh, on the Middle Rio Grande, but um, of course that can be measured and I can be, uh, you know, we can we can test that. Um, let's see what else do I want to say about that. Um, I, I guess all of this is is short term, right? I mean, four years, six years seems like a long time, but it's really not. It's really short. So we're we're just seeing sort of those most acute responses to biocontrol. Okay. Now your second question had to do with the kochia and the arrowweed coming in, and and that's a good point. That again, this is yet temporary, and these. Remember, these systems are dynamic. They can change due to flooding, um, and we should suspect that as vegetation matures in those sites, things like trees are going to shade out those secondary species, and their abundances should decline. Um, I think it's it's still important to have some element of of large mature trees, and if that means leaving some tamarisk in place. Um, that would probably be beneficial, um, yeah, for for those. I mean, that's what I would expect with those weedy species. But, you know, the, there still needs to be, I think, some intervention because the kochia and the arrowweed, it's thick, but it's low, and it's structurally just, I think, not that interesting for, for habitat. So I hope I answered some of your questions, Mark. You did. Thank you. 